Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Well guys, it's happened to me yet once again. We have adopted a new member of the family in the Keys uh, home for wayward machines. And uh, we've brought in a beautiful old beast here that needs a little TLC, but I think she's gonna really be a great addition to the shop. Meet Mr. Lucas number 31. This is a horizontal boring mill and uh, I am proud to have her in the shop. So let me tell you a little bit about this machine, a little bit about the history, a little bit about how I came about it. So first off, I got an email almost a year ago from a viewer who was out in the Monroe, Louisiana area, who told me he had this machine and that uh, it was looking for a new home. And I was very interested because at the time I was actually kind of keeping my eye out for a horizontal boring mill something that was small enough to fit into my shop. And yes, this is a big machine. This is about the smallest as they come. Uh, and in the world of HPMs, this is a very small machine, but it's still a very big machine. I was looking for something that I could fit into my shop to be able to have uh, this uh, particular machine. I'd actually found one that was only a few miles from here. It was a G&E, about the same size but it was a basket case. It was in really poor condition, had missing parts, no tail stock, the motors were gone, it was all rusted up. And as bad as I wanted to save it, I just really wasn't getting feeling really good about it. And then almost while I was really looking at that, I found out about this one. And uh, this one was really, in my opinion, a much better candidate, mainly because it was running. Uh, the gentleman I bought it from had been using it in his shop. Uh, it was not something that I was going to have to do work to just to even get it to work. So uh, I really felt good about it. Uh, I actually drove out to Monroe, Louisiana back last fall. I inspected the machine in person. Uh, we made a deal on it, uh, pending me getting it picked up and moved, uh, which was going to require some logistics. I did not have a trailer big enough to haul this machine on myself, so I was going to have to recruit some help to do that. And uh, I had talked with a friend of mine who did have a trailer, and uh, we were gonna make a trip out there together and get it uh, back this spring. Uh, fast forward a little bit, we were at our scraping class back in uh, January down in Florida. I mentioned this to uh, uh, John Terry, who was the host for the scraping class. And uh, John, uh, he actually has a lumber business, and, and he said, you know what? He says, I, I send trucks right past Monroe almost every single week hauling lumber. And a lot of times they're coming back empty. He says, if you want me to, I'll, I'll pick up that machine and bring it back to his place, which was in Destin, Florida. And uh, he said that then I could just worry about getting it from there up to here. So again, we worked out a deal on that. And uh, about March, I guess about April, uh, he actually got the machine picked up and moved down to his place. At that time, I was making arrangements to worry about trying to get it moved up here. And that was, about the time that COVID hit and everything locked down and this machine just kind of got put on the back burner. Fortunately, it was not in John's way. He had plenty of room to store it. So it's been sitting down in Florida since about uh, March or April. And uh, it just worked out this past week that I was able to get it up here. And again, I had already had plans uh, either later this month or next month to go down there and get it again with a barred trailer and what have you. Uh, but turned out again, things just kind of fell into place. Uh, Jason McDonald was bringing a machine from Texas down to John Terry's place. He was leaving there, headed back up to Illinois. He was going home empty. I said, hey, how much would you charge me to bring that on up to, to my place? It was more or less on his way. He gave me a really good price, and uh, he hauled it up the last little bit. And uh, once it got here, uh, last, uh, I guess it was Sunday afternoon or evening, uh, he pulled in with it. I had a big uh, forklift that I was able to borrow from a friend of mine. Military forklift picks up probably 15,000 pounds easily. Uh, I don't know the exact capacity of it. I knew it would pick up this no problem at all. I already had that here. Uh, Jason came in, we picked it up off of his truck and was able to get it set into the shop uh, Sunday evening. Uh, after that, I actually got it moved uh, from uh, where it was sitting inside the door over to here. Uh, if you don't believe it or not, I actually moved this machine all by myself. Uh, I used some rollers that I had plus a pallet jack. I got two 4,000 pound dollies. I put two on either end down here, uh, the pallet jack on this end 
and uh, I used a, a tractor to kind of push it with at first, and once I kind of got it in here where I couldn't push it no more, I took a come along and a chain and opened up the door over here to the side and actually hooked that up to my tractor, but using the come along where I could control it, just kind of pulled it right in here. So uh, I'm almost a 10,000 pound machine, and I pretty much moved it in the shop all by myself. That was a little bit of a fun little thing. Uh, yesterday, I got some power hooked up to it. I will say that my power cord is temporary. Uh, this for, I needed a 30 amp circuit to run this. I have a 30 amp circuit for my big lathe, so I was able to kind of stretch an extension cord over there and get it hooked up. My plan is, is I'm going to be putting in another 30 amp circuit over here uh, to make this a little bit not quite as uh, crazy looking as it is. But anyway, we had it, got it where it would fire up. I have fired this machine up. We'll, take you guys on a tour of it here in just a minute. So before I give you a tour of the machine, let me tell you a little bit about its history. And I was very fortunate, the gentleman that I purchased this from, uh, he told me that he bought the machine back in January of 2000. He used it in his shop uh, that he had in Monroe, Louisiana, like I mentioned before. And uh, when he got it, he contacted Lucas. Lucas was still in business at that time. Uh, they have been sold. I think that the company is technically still around, but it was bought by another company. I have not reached out to them yet, but he was able to call them up. Uh, he was able to give them the serial number off this machine. He actually was needing a part for it. And... Uh, uh, he had to call them to find out where the serial number is. And I'm going to give you guys, I don't know exactly where because I haven't actually been into this, but he said that the serial number is not in a conspicuous place at all. And he called Lucas and it turned out it was actually stamped up underneath one of the covers uh, for one of the gearboxes. He had to actually take a, par a cover off and then he found the serial number. Uh, but when he did find the serial number, he contacted them and they were able to give him a little bit of a history on it. So the history that he was told on this is that it was sold and shipped out of Cleveland, Ohio, where it was built on September 27th, 1918. Uh, so this machine is over 100 years old. And it was sent on a rail card, a rail car uh, out to Western Pipe and Steel in San Diego, California. He said the shipping weight on the machine was 9,500 pounds, uh, which we're assuming is pretty much uh, along the lines of what it is still today. The original purchase price on this was $4,500 back in 1918. That was a chunk of money uh, back in that day. Um, he said that they were that the company Lucas had been contacted several times over the years regarding uh, parts and information. Uh, the last two times that they were contacted was in 1953 and 1955, uh, looking for some parts. He was told that Lucas did still have some parts for these. They still had all of the original drawings. They still had all of the original patterns and cores, uh, and they could pretty much make anything. This was back in 2000. I don't know if that's still true today or not, but at least at that time, they would make anything that you needed for this. The last Model 31 that was built by Lucas was built in 1928. So again, this is a 1918 model, about 10 years before they discontinued this. And actually, uh, from my understanding, they went to a different design, gave it a new model number, but it was kind of based on this design. It was just kind of an evolution. He said that he purchased it from a shop in West Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, and that shop had purchased it from a shop in uh, Faraday, Louisiana. And they really don't know much about how it got from California all the way out to Louisiana. But since then, it has traveled uh, uh, to Florida and now up to Georgia. So this machine has uh, done a pretty good tour of the United States, if you think about it. Gone from Ohio to California to Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, and no telling where else in between. So anyway, uh, just a little bit of information and history on it. I thought you guys would enjoy Hearing. Well, guys, I just finished oiling all the oil holes that I could find on this. I found 58 oiling points on this machine, believe it or not, and I'm not sure I have found them all yet. Um, I think I found most of them anyway. Amazing. So before I power this thing up, I'm going to warn you, she's noisy, and uh, this thing has a lot of gears in there. There's a lot of bevel gears that move things in different angles. And this machine was made in 1918. It is going to be noisy. It's not terrible, but uh, be ready. Runs off of a 10 horsepower motor. Uh, was I got that going. There's a clutch right here. That engages everything on here. I'm going to start uh, 
I think I'm going to start by raising the head up. There's a series of uh, slide levers here. Let me zoom in and show you those. So there's three slide levers here, and there's a little piece that slides back and forth that allows you to move in two different directions. Uh, this one here moves the head up when it's engaged. Uh, I want to raise it up a little bit. I had lowered it down a few minutes ago. If we go the other direction here, that actually uh, starts feeding the spindle out here. This reverses it. This one moves the cross feed on the table. And I'm not sure what happens in that direction. Nothing right now. Maybe something we need to work on. This moves the table in and out. And I'm not sure what the other side does. It's not moving right now. Saddle. Uh, basically, four things. So I think we pretty much moved everything that needs to move on here. I've got the spindle engaged now, so now it's turning. And if I want to, again, feed in to drill. Oh, there we go, we're feeding. If I want to feed in, I can just uh, move there to feed the spindle in. All of the other levers and stuff down here have to do with speeds and feeds of the spindle, of the everything going on here. And I've, I haven't even gotten in there and started trying to figure out all this. There's a brass plate down here that explains it all, uh, but I haven't really gotten into it yet. Uh, there is a uh, handle down here where I can feed that spindle in by hand, as well as uh, using the auto feed. That's got it in auto feed mode there. One thing I want to take a look at is kind of see how much run out we have in the spindle down here. Again, this is a 100 year old machine, so I'm not expecting it to be perfect. Uh, this takes a number five Morse taper. I've got a number five to number three reducer in here, and then I've got a uh, just a drill arbor that's in very good shape, uh, brand new here. Uh, that I can run the indicator on to kind of check it run out. Now I will comment that my number five to number three adapter in there is a little bit beat up. Some of the run out here could be in that adapter, uh, but I'm gonna assume for now it's all in the spindle. Uh, when I run it, looks like we've got about 11 thou uh, run out there. Uh, not perfect by any means, but for a 100 year old machine, it's probably not that bad either. And I'm hoping I can put a different adapter in there and make that a little bit better. So I extended the arbor pretty much all the way out to the end of its reach and I'm doing this again. And it looks like we've got about 15 thou of run out out here. So similar to up all the way in, maybe about another four or five thou. A couple other things I'll just point out on the machine. Uh, it did come with the extension table, which is a nice accessory to have. Uh, most of the time you don't find that. Basically, this table just kind of clamps down. If you got something long that's bridging a big area, uh, you can either bolt it down to this if you're boring something, or you can uh, just let your part slide on that, bolt it down to the table either way. Uh, but it is nice to have this little accessory. It comes off if you don't need it on here. Uh, they put it on for shipping. Again, the other thing here is the tailstock. And again, this is something else that very often when you find a horizontal boring mill, the tailstock is MIA. Uh, one cool thing about this is, uh, well, first off, what's it for? This is a boring machine. Uh, and one of the very common things you would do is you'd put a boring bar in here that would come out of the spindle and it would actually go through the tailstock and it would support it out here on the end. So you could, you know, let's say we were doing the steam cylinders or needing to bore them out. We could strap it down to the table, bolt it down to the table, uh, put a boring bar in here that's turning that has a cutter in it that's going around and around and you can move the table back and forth or you can move the spindle in and out and actually bore that uh, hole over a, over a line. So this tailstock is, is aligned with the headstock and what's cool is is when uh, it's, it's all geared so that when I raise 
the headstock up, the support in here will go up as well. Let me show you. So if you look, this is rising up. There's a shaft that goes through here, another turn in here, and you can see this is rising up as well. So what is my plans with this machine? Well, number one, I'm glad to have a machine that again is plug and play. I can turn it on and use it. Now this machine, yes, it's 100 years old, 102 years old. Uh, and yeah, it's got some issues. I, 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 I knew there were issues with it when I got it. However, most of the issues on here appear to be minor and they appear to be things that I can fix. Uh, as far as like spindle run out and all that, we're gonna have to investigate that. But honestly, 10 thou run out on this, uh, we can probably live with that. And uh, even though you got some run out, when you're boring, it's still more than likely boring a true uh, circle, even though you got a little bit of run out on here. So it's probably not a huge issue, uh, but we do want to try to fix it. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I have no idea where we're even going to start there. My thoughts is, is short term, we're going to probably use the machine like it is. Long term, I do see this as being a restoration project, something that we're going to tear into and uh, try to take care of, probably start with the little things first. Um, you know, at the very least, I wanna get the, this, uh, this old peeling paint peeled off of it and get a nice paint job on it so at least it looks nice. Um, you know, the, the ways on this should be a fairly easy scraping job. I say easy, it really is gonna depend on how much wear is in there and we won't know that until we, uh, we check it out. But uh, with it being flat box ways, it's a lot easier to do that than it is uh, uh, the, the tapered or the, the, the V ways. So uh, that, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, as far as the table or whatever goes, if there needs to be work done to that, once I get my metal planer going, this is actually something that we could probably put on the metal planer and do some machining to if we needed to. This will fit on my metal planer. Um, and, you know, at some point in time, we'll probably pull the spindle out. Uh, I may see about getting this bar reground so that it's nice and true if there's any wear in it. I suspect there is. And probably replace the, the bronze bearings that are in the spindle. And that should hopefully take care of any kind of run out that it has. Um, until I really get a chance to play around with this machine and uh, do a job or two on it, I really don't know what it's gonna need. Uh, but talking to the previous owner, he was using this machine and he was having good luck with it. I mean, he told me flat out, he says, no, it's not perfect, uh, but it's a usable machine. So uh, I felt good about bringing it into the shop. And this is the kind of thing I like. This is a, a machine that many people would probably consider scrap. Uh, but this one in my, in my book, at least based on the things that I bring to the shop, is probably in better shape than most machines that I've started with. And uh, we've, we have restored much worse than this in the past. So uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we can do a good job with this one as well. And as long as I'm showing you new additions to the shop, let me share with you uh, my very latest additions to the shop. Uh, picked up a pair of kittens this past week. And uh, the story on this is, is I got up for my morning walk uh, yesterday morning that would have been tuesday morning this past the week before this video post i was out uh, doing my morning walk and uh, i usually get up before daylight and start my walk and then the sun kind of comes up and things get light i had uh, had walked down to where i was going turned around and came back when i came back it was starting to get light and i noticed over in the ditch on the side of the road there were two little kittens that some sorry excuse of a human being had Put out on the side of the road and I just couldn't leave them there so when I got through my walk I went and got my truck went back and picked them up my plan was as we were going to try to find a home for them but giving away kittens is not very easy so I about come to the conclusion that these are going to be shop cats uh, that come in here so this is ginger uh, she's taking a nap right now and uh, my wife went ahead and named them so now that they've been named I guess they're going to have to stay so let me show you the other one we got. And cat number two, we got Ginger. So this one's gonna be Marianne. Many of you older guys will know where that comes from. You younger folks uh, may not recognize those names, but those were two of the uh, cast members in uh, Gilligan's Island, the old TV show from back in the day. My wife said since one was 
a redhead. She was going to name it Ginger, and this uh, brunette over here was going to be Marianne. So uh, that's what that's what their names are going to be. So there you go. I hope you enjoy our new shop additions, both this nice Lucas uh, number 31 horizontal boring mill, as well as our new shop mates, uh, Mary Ann and Ginger uh, from the Gilligan's Island. So <laughs> wasn't planning on getting some more cats, but uh, that's just the way it turned out. I just couldn't leave them poor creatures on the side of the road, and now I'm stuck with them. Guys, that is going to be a wrap. I hope you enjoy seeing my, my new addition to the shop. I'm excited about it. I've got a good dose of iron to help take care of my iron deficiency disorder, at least for a little while. Uh, and happy to have these machines in the shop finally. Like I said, I've known about this one now for almost a year, been anticipating getting it in here. So it's really nice to finally have it in the shop and finally be able to start doing something with it. And with that, guys, that will be it on this video. As always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Those comments are always appreciated, as are the thumbs up on the videos. And guys, we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.